Welcome once again in the third and last sessions of interactive teleconference. Today uh, we are discussing on the atiopathogenesis of acute coronary syndrome. We have started this discussion uh, uh, from the previous sessions and we have already discussed the uh, like atiopathogenesis of plaque formation which is the main cause of this uh, acute coronary syndrome and uh, we have uh, Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Bhatia is uh, already uh, discussing on this. Before going to the topic, I will Chennai, yeah, Chennai, please. Chennai. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Ye yes, Chennai, please. Ask your Hello. Yes, ask your questions. Hello. Hello. Hello, we are listening up. Hello. Hello. Hello, we are listening. Please ask. Hello. 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 Yes, please. What is your questions? Hello. Hello. Are you listening to Chennai? Yeah. Please, we are listening you. Please ask your questions. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're able to hear us. Yeah, we are uh, able to hear you. Please is, uh, ask your questions. Why not uh, DVT thrombus can cannot be thrombolized when uh, pulmonary embolus can be thrombolized? I'll just keep, I'll just keep the phone, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, I got a question. Uh, you had asked uh, why DVT thrombus cannot be thrombolized and. Uh, uh, when when a pulmonary embolism can be thrombolized? Uh, is a good question and it's not that DVT cannot be thrombolized. If you have very extensive DVT which is life threatening, you have a condition which is called phlegmasia dolens. In that case, if you have severe life threatening problems, you can go ahead and do thrombolysis there also. Catheter based uh, it means you can uh, thrombolize the patient but then the thing is that um, uh, you know, you have to give a large amount of thrombolytic therapy for a large period of time. If you have extensive, uh, you know, deep uh, vein plexus thrombosis, you can go and thrombolize the patient even then if it's a massive. It's not that in DVT you cannot thrombolize, but there are specific indications in which you could thrombolize patients who have DVT. Extensive DVT, which is all often limb threatening, you can go ahead and thrombolize the patients. Yeah. So there should not be any uh, doubt about it that you cannot uh, thrombolize the vein thrombosis. It can be also, but mm -hmm. it's depending upon the other factors. Uh, here I also would like to uh, say thanks to the student from our Ranchi. Uh, we have received the facts you have sent that you are uh, watching our program. And I am very much thankful, uh, especially on the Ranchi Center, that they are always very much interactive, although uh, other uh, centers are also uh, interactive like this. So, uh, not wasting too much time, I would like to uh, request uh, Dr. Bhatia to uh, start with the discussions, wherever we left in the previous uh, sessions. Yeah, I think we had left on the topic of the vulnerable plaque. And uh, there are two, three things which are important here. Uh, as you would see, the various characteristics of the vulnerable plaque, one is the high macrophage density. Again, this goes to show that the inflammatory levels are much high within these plaques. So, because the macrophage is the one which shows that there is a large amount of inflammation which is going on. Another important thing to understand is that the degree of cross-sectional stenosis is mentioned here as less than 50%. So, it's important to understand that the, that the plaques which usually rupture cause acute coronary syndromes are the ones which are not so significantly causing obstruction. Because if you had stable plaques which were more than you know 70%, so over a period of time you would have you know means collaterals being formed. But it is a lesser degree of, uh, you, know, the, you know, the cross-sectional stenosis which usually give rise to, you know, the acute coronary syndrome. So, this is another important thing uh, that is to be understood. That is why uh, more modalities are coming in uh, to identify these one plaques as we shall be discussing subsequently also. Now, what is that causes the plaque erosion or the rupture to occur? Now, there are several factors that have been found which are called the triggers. These include arousal from sleep physical exertion, mental stress, anger, sexual activity, cold exposure, cocaine and marijuana abuse, especially in the West, heavier pollution and sleep apnea. All these are thought to bring about increased platelet activation, increase in clotting factors, higher blood pressure, higher heart rates and reduced fibromatic activity. Alongside, there is a heightened sympathetic tone, reduced parasympathetic tone, increased coronary vasomotor tone. 
all these go on to cause plaque erosion or rupture. Now, if we see the relative risk of one developing myocardial infarction following triggering events including the effect of exercise frequency on risk, we find that supposing if a patient had undergone an exercise, heavy exertion, the chances of one developing MI are maximum in the first hour. If the patient had sexual intercourse or a bout of severe anger in the next two hours, if the patient has used cocaine or marijuana, the relative risk of one developing an acute coronary syndrome is maximum in the first hour after the abuse of the substance. The relative risk of exercise triggering an MI is 5.9 vis-a-vis -vis the others which are around 2 to 2.5 in case of sexual intercourse and anger. In the morning time, the chances are 1.38 times higher. Just look at cocaine abuse. The higher risk is 23.8 times higher risk of one developing a or triggering of an acute coronary event. Now, one would see from this and say that if one is exercising, we usually say that exercising is good, but then if you are exercising, your chances of developing a MI are much higher in the first hour, so then why one should exercise? Now, we have to look at the other part of the slide. People who are exercising less than one time a week have got higher risk. But if patients are exercising regularly, they are in much more, you know, a much more uh, better state of health, the chances come down drastically. So it is 107 times higher relative risk if you are exercising less than one times a week. And it's 8.6 if you are just exercising three to four times a week. So exercising is good. We are not proscribing exercise in any way. Although the risk is high in the first one hour, it is much more higher in patients who are inactive patients who are obese eh, of developing an MI and they are much lower in patients who are regularly exercising. Now uh, coming to the next slide, seeing the triggering events again, you know, because we are trying to understand the pathogenesis, this is often overlooked, you know, by the students, they are more interested in reading about aspirin, about ticlopidine, clopidogrel, about, you know, fibrinolytic agents, so these things are often overlooked, so that is why I have made slides specifically to deal with these particular issues. Now if you see the time of exertion as we already said, if you are having an exercise protocol, the chances are maximum in the first hour. But once the first hour is over, this, it falls to less than one. And now seeing, now somebody would say that means exercising is harmful. But as I already mentioned, people who are doing heavy physical exertion say more than five times per week, their relative risk is well below four. But if you are exercising zero times, it's about 100. So that means if you exercise regularly, your chances of triggering any event after exercise are much lower. It just goes down exponentially from 100 to, you know, if you are exercising 1 to 2 times, it comes down to 20. If you are exercising uh, 3 to 4 times per week to 10 and then your relative risk is down to, you know, 2. Uh, in fact, it is 1.86 to be precise if you are exercising more than 5 times a week. Similarly, mental stress, very important. Everybody is under mental stress. Mental stress, frustration, anger, you know, uh, you know, outbursts of anger are all known to trigger off, uh, you know, acute coronary syndromes. A very interesting slide uh, in the period of, uh, the upper one is showing the period of 1990 and this is 1991. Uh, this is the time when the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, uh, you know, the number of patients presenting with acute coronary syndrome, the Tel Aviv was found to be significantly higher uh, during the timing that the bombings were taken uh, in Tel Aviv, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the previous year when they were much lower. So mental stress does uh, precipitate acute coronary syndromes. Now, acute coronary syndromes are more common during the early morning hours. We all know it. And uh, it is very important for us, especially for all of the PGDCC students who are doing emergency casualty duties to understand that if any